everybody, we're working on the next of our uh, series in the Celebration of Discipline. Uh, we are taking a look at the last of the outward, what Foster describes in his book as the outward uh, disciplines. These are disciplines that form or shape our context or our relationships with others. And in this one uh, is one that's probably familiar with most people. It's the discipline of service. And so we're going to think a little bit about what it means, um, how service frames our relationships with, with one another, really. So our scripture reading this morning comes from the Gospel of Matthew, it's chapter 20, verses 20 through 28. Then the mother of the sons of Zebedee came to him with her sons. And kneeling before him, Jesus, she asked a favor of him. And he said to her, what do you want? She said to him, Declare that these two sons of mine will sit, one at your right hand and one at your left in your kingdom. But Jesus answered, You do not know what you are asking. Are you able to drink the cup that I am about to drink? And they said to him, We are able. And he said to them, You will indeed drink my cup, but to sit at my right hand and at my left, this is not mine to grant, but it is for those for whom it has been prepared by my father. When the ten heard it, they were angry with the two brothers. But Jesus called them to him and said, you know, that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their great ones are tyrants over them, but it will not be so among you. But whoever wishes to be great among you must be your servant, and whoever wishes to be first among you must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve, and to give his life a ransom for many. The word of God for the people of God. So last week we talked about how God is, is working to set us into uh, right relationships. Right relationships with God, right relationships with others, um, and with ourselves, relating to ourselves, how we think about ourselves. Um, and our relationship with God is somewhat unique, of course, because for, for God, who is ever on our side, um, who loves and cares for us more than we can love and care for ourselves, right? For who is completely interested in your genuine well-being, right? Like perfectly, <laughs> perfectly interested in your well-being. Um, our right relationship with God is based on obedience. Uh, we'd be fools not to be obedient to the ground of all being who wants only the best for you, because anything that God uh, has for us is for our benefit. And to reject that is really to just hurt ourselves. It's a form of self-harm. And to some extent, that virtue of obedience is echoed uh, imperfectly in our parental relationships uh, and reflected in that commandment to honor our mothers and fathers. But just like any other human being, um, our human relationships are are tainted. They're they're potentially broken, and so the virtue of obedience have to be tempered with that reality. Uh, humans can be jerks to one another, even parents to their children, and so the the honoring of our mother and father is tempered by the fact that they're human too, uh, and so uh, there may be cases where they don't deserve our obedience. So obedience, I think, really is. A virtue that is most closely tied with our relationship with God and to some extent with others, uh, other human beings, but that has to be, um, that that has to come with a grain of salt, if you know what I mean, because, or, or, a, or, or a bit of a, a bit of skepticism. We have to be, be wary because of the brokenness of the human condition. Perfect obedience to other humans is not necessarily desired. Really, when we're talking obedience, we're talking to God who always is on our side. When we're talking about other human beings, the virtue that best frames our relationship with others is service. So that's what we're going to talk a little bit about today. Um, so how does the virtue of service become the foundation, right? How do we act toward one another is really the question at the heart of it. We act as servants to one another. Having an attitude of service as the primary, what do you want to call it, the primary relational pattern between one another. 
allows us to account for that human brokenness. We can help one another even when we are broken. We can help one another when the other is broken, right? And we, and we are all to some degree or another broken, right? So we're, we're, we're muddling through uh, the best we can. Um, but the, the attitude, the, the kind of the orientation that we have should be on how can we help one another. Um, and, and that, you know, you could, one image of that might be that we're, we're all sort of floating in the water after the ship went down. <laughs> you know, right? we're clinging to whatever flotsam and jetsam happen to be around us and, and helping others to do the same. We're all in this sort of endangered place, endangered of drowning and so on. And we're all dealing with, with diseases and addictions and disorders and frailties and all the, the clutter and, and brokenness of life. Uh, and that's dangerous and deadly. And, and so it represents the, the deeps, the water that we're floating in and, and, and without, you know, a, a boat. Um, and, and so, and so we know, we know that catastrophe can strike us or our loved ones at any time. And so that's the state everyone's in. That's the state every human being is in. And so there's a certain togetherness that we can feel for one another as fellow human beings, uh, trying to survive after the shipwreck, you know, if we allow it. And I think that's what Jesus is trying to to stir up in us a, a certain sympathy or empathy that's easy for us when we look around and see uh, that in the right circumstances, or should I say the wrong circumstances, what is happening to that person over there uh, can happen to you, right? Because we're all in this same sort of uh, potentially catastrophic space. And the discipline of service then is built upon that natural empathy that we feel for one another, that, that feeling of camaraderie, that brotherhood or sisterhood that we hold for our fellow human beings because we all live in a state of this high drama. It's nothing but an utter chance that we were born uh, into nations or cultures that are, that are riven by wars or famines or other terrible conditions. And we in, uh, in the United States are, 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 are blessed to have the kind of peace and stability that we have enjoyed. But that's that's the rare, this is more the rare case, I think, in, in history and in the world at large, uh, that, that that's the case, that we have this sort of long periods of, of stability, whereas I think the norm is that there's there's a threat, there's always a threat of, of uh, terrible things, um, and I guess we got a taste of that with COVID, I think that we, we recognize the threat that, you know, pathogens can have viruses, you know, even, um, you know, terrible type flu viruses or other, whatever. I mean, we, we understand that, that we are, there's a frailty to us. There's a vulnerability to human beings that if we, uh, that, that pushes us toward a state of service toward one another, because we're all in this together, that kind of a thing, right? Let's, let's help one another out. Let's keep each other on our feet. That, that's the kind of, orientation that Jesus is calling for us. Um, what can we do to help? What can we do to aid one another? If you're in a good place, can I lift someone else up onto the life raft or whatever, you know, image you want to, to play. But essentially the bottom line is how can we, how can we reduce any unnecessary suffering that we see around us? So that's, that's one angle to this, this idea of service, but let's approach this from another angle because you're likely to notice this on your spiritual journey. If you remember from the beginning of this whole series, the goal of the spiritual journey is essentially the resignation of the self, the letting go of uh, the what you would call um, what you would call you, and and an embracing of the you that God calls you. And so this this process of resignation, I've said before, feels feels like a kind of death to the self. It's what is exactly what Christ calls for in Christians: a death to the self and a new life. In Christ, and so as we approach our spiritual death, as we untangle ourselves from, uh, as we untangle ourselves from our own desires, as we untangle ourselves from the things that, that grip us in this world, as we as we let go of of these things that have defined us all our lives, well, as we approach this sort of spiritual death, and we find ourselves at a bit of a loss, because the things that we used to mean something to us 
to our old selves no longer genuinely no longer hold any interest to us. The things that we use to, 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 to distract ourselves from our pain, the habits that we formed as part of our own sort of personal strategy to make it through, they've all become somewhat unfulfilling. They're not, they don't hold the, the power that they used to. Uh, things have become uninteresting. Uh, not not because of the, the activity has changed at all. It's just because your internal state is different now. And it's just not attracted to the, to the same things that, uh, that you used to be. The fact of the matter is, the more that we untangle, the more that we dis, uh, disabuse ourselves of our, of our self-constructed self, the more we find ourselves wondering what to do with our time. Uh, we're not sure what to do. I don't really, you know, want to have a beer. And I don't really want to play that video game. Or I don't really want to do this or to do that. Whatever it was that was that you kind of filled your time with and, and, and graced yourself with, I, I used to want to do those things, but now it's not really part of who I am anymore. And and it feels uncomfortable because there's not there's no go to thing for 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 a kind of pleasure uh, there, or a, or a desire that drives you. Right, it's it's a sort of the like a life view of working for the weekend, right? Well, if you're just kind of working along and you're just looking forward to the weekend, and you hate your job or whatever, whatever it was, you're like this. The same pattern exists. You, you you look forward to the weekend, and and now let's say in this analogy, the weekend doesn't hold any value for you anymore. Then you find yourself working and you're like, well, I used to have in my mind this pattern that I look forward to the weekend. And now the weekend doesn't exist. And so now what? Now who am I? Right? I used to look forward to the game on Sunday morning. And that used to be my ritual. And I was excited about football and what, you know, what's going to happen and, and the whole drama of it. And then as time goes on, I've, I've kind of let go of those things. And now I, I don't know what to do with myself. I don't really care about football or, you know, whatever it was. It, it, I mean, it, it's, it's, it, 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 it's different for all of us, of course. Now that I've gotten rid of all of it, what do I do? You see, uh, the, the self that, that collected those things, if you, if you like collecting things, or the self that desired to spend time in that way, the self that hoarded and was desperately seeking things of self, that self is dead or dying. And the only answer that I found to fill the hole that is satisfying is service. The only thing that seems useful in these times when we have really gotten close to letting go and resigning ourselves the only way to spend time that feels genuinely fulfilling is in service to others. So whether that's doing something useful for your family or for your community or for your church or whatever it might be, uh, that's how you can spend your time as you get close to this spiritual resignation. Spend time delighting others. Spend time making other people smile. Spend time making other people's lives better. Spend time alleviating suffering that 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 we don't need to suffer, right? When you spend time in that way, you find yourself that that's the only thing that's meaningful anymore. That's the only thing that, that, that accounts. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a natural consequence of the, of the, of the letting go of the self is the desire for, to just serve uh, each other. Um, and that, and that's a wonderful thing because you, it's not about you, like, willing yourself, well, I'm not going to that food shelf and blah, 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 and make a difference in the world. No. Uh, you go to the food shelf because there's nothing else to do that makes any difference. It, it, it's a natural outpouring of desire to serve. It's not a, a function of the will. See? So the discipline of service is also kind of nice because it works It works both ways in some, some sense. So what, what do I mean by that? But that's to say that... You may not have really been actively involved in your own spiritual journey, this the spiritual journey of resignation that I'm talking about. You might be like, ah, Pastor, that's a bunch of nonsense. Well, you may not have thought explicitly about all of this, but purely out of empathy for others, purely out of your natural desire to help others, maybe you've sought out ways to be of service, and you have spent a lot of time being of service to others. The cool thing about this discipline is the, the act of service pulls you toward a resignation of the self, 
right? There's all kinds of movies about this or stories about this where where the 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 uh, the the person who's kind of caught up in themselves and harsh, you know, runs into a circumstance that that changes their heart in some way, an act of service that changes of their changes their heart. Um, sorry. In any case, the, the the idea being that the the um, the act of service both pulls us toward a resignation, and our acts of resignation pull us toward service. So it works in both ways. You see what I mean? Uh, you can go either direction. You can dive into service for non-spiritual reasons and find yourself being called into the spiritual journey. Or you could start your spiritual journey and come to a point where you have nothing left to do but service. And either way is fine. Either way is fine. But let me mention this. I've often run into people, good people, who have told me I'm not really interested in the spiritual side of things. God and church and all that. I figure it's good enough to be a good person and to serve others. And they go off and they do wonderful things for people. But it's not. It's not good enough, though. It's not good enough, though. Just being a good person is not fulfilling. It's not good enough. Why? Uh, because if you are the determining factor in what is good, if you decide this is what's good, there's nothing transcendent about you. You are just your own God. And you may be doing good things, but you're the one that's defining the good. And that's a big, that's a big problem. Uh, you are not a good enough God to be God for yourself. You see, you, you don't even know what it, what it is to be good without God. And so it, it's a made up goodness. And, and so people who say, I'm just going to be a good person and go do good things. Well, you are participating in the life of God. You may decide you don't want to call it that. Uh, but that is what you're doing, uh, because all goodness comes comes from God. You know, and, and and if we're if we're in a place where we're just sort of making up our own goodness, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that, and that makes me a good person, and I don't need God or church or anything else other other stuff. Then and and that's just a thing that you use to soothe yourself and keep yourself in your own control. But that's that's exactly what Christ is calling us to give up. People who go that way end up being martyrs, like self-martyrs, you know, like nobody, nobody, you know, understands or respects, uh, 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 or, or recognizes my, my effort and my service to others and, and the, the desire to be lauded. I think we've all known people like that who, who, who do good things for others, but make themselves just a, a nagging pest all along the way. Uh, and, and it's really because they're still self-centered. They're, they're doing service out of their own, sense of self instead of out of God's sense of self. True service has no interest in accolades or applause. True service has no interest in recognition and the and the and the reason is, ironically, that you're you are not serving others for the sake of others, but for the sake of God. And that's a it's a strange concept for us. Uh, so when when we're oriented toward God, we find ourselves serving others with joy. Not because we want anything out of it but because there's, there's somewhat the natural thing to do. And frankly, it's the only thing to do. It's like listening to music you like and finding your foot tapping to it unconsciously. Right? You're moving because you like the music. In the same way, you're acting with service in the world because of the creational love that has reformed you. It has nothing to do about achieving anything. So, that's service. I hope you have a great week, and may God bless you. Amen.